Two weeks ago, filmmaker and journalist Brent Renault lost his life documenting the horrors of the battlefield in Ukraine. Tributes immediately poured in for the award-winning filmmaker. The head of police in Kyiv said at the time that Renault, quote, paid with his life for an attempt to shed light on how underhand, cruel, and merciless the aggressor is. He was traveling at the time with a photojournalist, Juan Arredondo, who barely escaped with his own life and is now receiving care at the New York Presbyterian Columbia University Irving Medical Center. In his first interview since that day, I was able to speak with Arredondo about his friend and the attack he calls an ambush. We warn you some of the images you'll see are graphic, but as we always try to communicate in these instances, we think it's necessary to show them to understand what is happening in Ukraine and what Brent Renault gave his life trying to capture. Do you remember what happened? Yeah, yeah, it, I remember the day very clearly. What was the plan that day? So the plan was, so the reason we were in Kiev, we were looking for refugees, uh, but they already told us that the city was a transit city, that there were no shelters. It was just basically people being evacuated. Juan Arredondo and his friend and colleague Brent Renault weren't looking to document the fighting in Ukraine. Instead, they wanted to tell the stories of refugees who were fleeing the war. They headed to Erpin, where they heard thousands of civilians were being evacuated. At that point, Irpin was, uh, they, had, they had destroyed the bridge right. from Irpin to, to prevent Russian forces from coming, okay. being able to come across. Come and we had seen on Saturday, uh, Clarissa Ward had done some uh, live shots at the point where the, uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of displaced people were coming out of Irpin, mm -hmm. kind of being helped across the bridge. And then Lindsay Adario was there when a rocket hit. Mm -hmm. uh, Airpin and, and a family was killed. Yeah, I was killed. Well, we were there on a Sunday, so that was the, that was after what happened with Lindsay. Okay. So that was much later there, that week, where from what our understanding, that part was already uh, that was a humanitarian corridor. We did see a small. When we were there, we saw maybe three cars coming in. They evacuated some civilians. Then we asked her, they're like they're coming from another bridge, um, and that's quite far, but it's still a corridor. So. We decided just to start walking. And it was, and, you, it was you and Brent? And it was me and Brent. That's when, well, two cars, two civilian cars approached us, but we couldn't communicate with them well. So we didn't know what they wanted. And then the third car that came uh, spoke some English, and they said, and we said, look, we're looking for this bridge where people have been evacuated. And he's like, yeah, I, I can take you guys mm -hmm. there. So we got on the car, and, um, and you know, it must have been maybe 10, maximum to 15 minutes that we were riding. And there was a checkpoint, but it was empty. And then there's the barricades. So as we started to zigzag through the barricades, I was sitting in the back behind Brent, and, and I was looking out the window, and then I saw in the trenches two, two military, one of them pull out the AK, and then I just shouted, like, we're, we're going to be we're getting shot. So could, I, could you tell whether they were Ukrainian or Russian? No, it was so fast. What leads me to think they were Russian is because, first of all, that was the corridor where people were evacuated, and we just came across a convoy of, of military, Ukrainian military. They were just walking and patrolling, but mm -hmm. they said, yeah, you can go this way. That's got to be so surreal to s actually see two guys get up and start yeah. to point. Yeah. I mean, to, to see it before it happens. Well, I, I, I just, I mean, I, yeah, my reaction was just to scream and, 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 and duck because I, I, didn't, I didn't think they were going to shoot, but mm -hmm. that was sort of my instinct. But it was surreal because we, we were convinced that we were in a place that, you know, I mean, was there dangerous? Yeah, should have, could have, it could have been, but, but it didn't, there was nothing that led us to believe that we were going to be ambushed or anything. Any sense of how many shots? Oh, it or? was just a lot. I mean, I can't, like, I try to remember, but it was just, it was just kind of raining. That's all I could hear is just hearing, hitting windows, hitting the kind of like tin, like metal, and, um, and then that's when I, I felt that I got shot. I yelled, I got shot, but I didn't get any response from Brent. Uh, you were down on the floor in the back yeah, seat? Yeah, in the back seat, yeah. And, um, Could you tell where you had been shot? Yeah, because I felt it right there, and, mm -hmm. I just, and I just touched it, and I feel like the bleeding. And it entered through? Uh, through through my, so, so my buttocks uh -huh. on, the, on the left, yeah. Uh -huh. But then I just st started like tapping my finger, my toes, just to make sure if I could, you know, if I lost feel. anything. Yeah. And I feel them, and I was like, okay, I'm fine. Um, and then I just kept yelling to the driver, just drive, go, go, go. And my recollection is that because of the sound the car was making, the car maybe had, had been damaged. Mm -hmm. And so he stopped, and that's when I looked up and I saw Brent, you know, exit. Now that I know it's an exit wound, mm -hmm. but it was a wound here, and so it was bleeding. I tried to grab onto it and maybe stop the bleeding. 
Was uh, he saying anything? I could see his mum, like he was trying to mumble things, but I couldn't make out what he was mm. saying. Then I saw the driver get out and then wave at another civilian car. Mm. And then, you know, they, they, we were trying to get, he, the driver was trying to get Brent out. I got out of the car and then they just shoved me into this car and then drove me out. Mm -hmm. But I kept saying, well, you know, bring Brent, bring Brent. Mm -hmm. And I think at that point is when maybe Brent was just, he was dead already. Yeah. Uh, and I remember just being in that car, I put my hand on, on, on the wound and, and I was starting to faint. And I was like, I can't, man, this mm -hmm. can't be. Like, I can't go. We all imagine how would we react in a situation where shots are being fired in our direction and you think intellectually, oh, this is what way it would happen or this is the way I, what I would do. Was it different than you had ever thought of it? I certainly never experienced an ambush like that. Um, but it's, there was a point that I thought, this is it, I'm gone. Mm. That I was laying down on the floor and it was so much, like I could hear so much hitting that car that I thought, okay, this is it. I'm not gonna survive this. Mm. And I, n I've never experienced that, that sensation, that, that feeling of knowing that this is it. Mm. Um, and it's not, it's not a feeling of being afraid, it's just coming to terms that uh, there's nothing I can do. This mm. is probably gonna be the end. Um, and then right after that thought is when I felt the shot and, and I shouted, I got shot and I don't know. And then it's just, just but it happened so fast that I, I couldn't tell how, what's the, the span of time from the moment the first shot was fired to the moment we stopped. Yeah. I hope that everything will be okay. Thank you. This is Juan at a hospital in Kyiv right after he was shot. Doctors found a fragment of the bullet lodged in his leg. Tell me please, what is your name? Juan. Juan? Juan. Where are you from? Uh, the U.S. Yes. What happened to you? My friend is Brent Renault, and he's been shot and left behind. And how is he? I don't know. You don't, I don't know. know. You don't know what happened to him? He was, I, I saw him being shot in the neck, and we got split. Juan says he didn't learn Brent had died until after he was out of surgery, when Brent's brother, Craig, called him to tell him the news. What, what was Brent like? Brent was a, you know, he was a good friend. He was a, you know, we met, we were doing a, a Neiman Fellowship up in Harvard, and that's where we met. But I remember him telling one thing that I'll never forget. He's like, we're not, we don't have a schedule. We don't follow a schedule. We follow a story. And if that requires to be 20 hours wake or whatever it takes to get mm -hmm. that story, we'll do it. So I understood that, and so we, we work well that way. Mm -hmm. And he was always concerned. I was concerned about me being, you know, being well, but also learning and becoming better and uh, so you know, it's rare to have a friend to work and not have any we never had any disagreements or anything mm. like that so that was very special when something like this happens I mean do you do you dream about it so that's interesting because you know I've been having a hard time sleeping mm. that that's part that's probably one of the parts that I've been struggling with is because I I don't sleep for long periods of time and I notice my dreams are very vivid mm -hmm. and um, and it's always in that car Hmm. Now, I don't recall everything. In your dreams, you're in that car. In that car, yeah. And I don't recall exactly what happens, but I do know I'm forcing myself to wake up so I don't live that. Hmm. So I'm waking up, I'm very jumpy all night, uh, wake up and sweat. I was reading that, um, I was reading about the funeral service that they held for Brent, which sounded really lovely. It sounded like there was a really big turnout. Yeah. I understand you asked that a poem be read, Invictus. Invictus. Poem, yeah. Is that a, was that a poem that he liked? A poem you you liked? It was a poem I liked, and it's a poem that I kept reading to myself. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments to scroll. I am the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. What does that mean to you? I mean, it, it got me through some really dark nights these these last two weeks. Especially when I was going to surgery, I kept saying those last lines. I'm a master of my faith, I'm the captain of my soul, like I'm not going to let this, I need to come out alive with this. Mm. I don't know why, it wasn't my time, That's, I keep asking that myself, why? But, but those nights that I was, it was, yeah, I was losing blood, I was really weak and I didn't know what, what was happening. Mm. So I remember those, those two lines.